Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg. And for my bad idea this week, I'm going to take you back, Tony. I'm going to take you back to the turn of the 20th century. We're in Two Harbors, Minnesota. And Two Harbors is a mining town. Uh, They started out as a little frontier, tiny village, and... They've been going through a lot of growth since the discovery of the Masabi Iron Range in 1866. Started out small, and now they're a thriving metropolis of 3,000 souls. And that's pretty good for a mining town. Well, and especially considering what they would have been without the mining, which is just a little outpost on the shores of Lake Superior. And they had just been outfitted with electricity, right? This newfangled thing called electric lights was very big. (laughs) And they, around, like, right at the turn of the century, right right on 1900, 1901, word starts spreading around town in Two Harbors, Minnesota, that someone has discovered a new type of mineral deposit. It's not iron. It's not copper. It's not gold or silver. All that stuff is bringing them in profits pretty regularly. This is a new and kind I'm of thing. I'm pretty sure that they know that that's not very new. Well, the iron deposit was from 1866. It was only 30 years ago. That's true. At their time. I was more thinking of Egyptians using copper tools. It's not exactly a new metal. No, it's not a new metal, Tony. This is not a new <laughs> mineral. It's a new discovery. And the discovery is of a mineral that is called corundum. And corundum, as you may have already known, is not ex- exciting like gold or even iron, Okay. You hear about those things. It's more fun to say, though. You know what they're going to be useful for. But corundum was a useful and needed product. In a world that was becoming increasingly industrialized, there was a demand for abrasives and grinding wheels to shape and sharpen steel and iron and for use in finishing furniture and hundreds of other tasks, large and small. And corundum was known as an amazing abrasive. It was very very hard. It's been likened to diamond. Corundum isn't as hard as diamond, but it's up there. It's real good. And if you are going to be moving forward into this industrialized age, as the U.S. is at this time, there's going to be a huge need for abrasives. And some enterprising souls in Two Harbors, Minnesota, realize that this is an opportunity. And so, they form a company to mine this corundum and sell it to grinding wheel manufacturers primarily. That's their target audience. A lot of grinding wheels out there, a lot of people needing corundum to build these grinding wheels, to supply these factories that are building all these new fancy things. We are going to be in on the ground floor of this industrial new wave. And they incorporate as the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company. And their whole purpose is to mine and sell corundum. Those M's will be important later. Don't spoil it, Tony. (laughs) So these guys have formed this company to mine corundum. And their first order of business, as men who know very little about mining and nothing about corundum or abrasives, is to raise some money. They don't go out and mine some mineral. They aren't trying to bag it up or anything. They start selling shares in their company that so far has done nothing I've heard of IPOs like that before. It's a weird thing. I mean, it, it's not unusual exactly, but the idea that you can say, we have a company, and we're ostensibly going to do a thing, and we'll just say, let's, you know, we're going to have a, uh, a trade in Bigfoot pelts, Tony. Me and you going to go into the Bigfoot <laughs> pelt trading business. All right? Lots of Bigfoots out there. All right? Pelts are worth a lot. And we're going to get some people in on the ground floor. So here for $10 a share, you can own part of the Alan Tony Bigfoot pelt training business. And people can buy those shares, despite the fact that Bigfoot does not exist. Probably. This sounds like a lot of Kickstarters, in all honesty. Okay, well, so this is the early 1900s version of Kickstarter. Um, And... They sell shares of their company at a rate of $1 a share. They also buy up a previous company uh, that had kind of had the same idea, the Minnesota Abrasive Company. Uh, They didn't have very much cash on hand, so they sold them shares. 
And neither one of these companies, the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company or the Minnesota Abrasive Company that they've just absorbed, has produced a single ounce of corundum at this point. Not only that, but nobody who's investing in this knows anything at all about the abrasives market. All right, They want to get into this market of selling material to grinding wheel manufacturers, but they don't actually have any connections with grinding wheel manufacturers. They haven't done in-depth research on the grinding wheel manufacturing markets. They just have this vague idea that people need to grind stuff and we got some stuff that can grind some things. Let's put together a company. I mean, I've heard of worse things. At least they know there's some demand, especially because they're in a mining town and they can see people need to sharpen their tools. But that is a weird place to start. They do eventually get some samples out of this mineral that they have discovered. And they send it to Chicago, the big city, to be tested. And the guy who they send to test this comes back and he's all reared up and excited. And he comes to the shareholders meeting and he's like, guys, we have got this stuff tested, and it has been rated fairly satisfactory by the men in Chicago. <laughs> None of these people realize that fairly satisfactory means that the material is just not suitable for making grinding wheels at all. Yeah, it's not like it was a fair shake type thing. It was just fairly okay for doing its job. It's kind of like genuine leather. The rating of genuine leather, it sounds cool, but it's actually the lowest grade of leather you could possibly get. Yeah, kind of like meat-like substance at Taco Bell. <laughs> so at the end of their first year of operation, Tony, they had mined no corundum and made no money. They'd spent some money, they'd hired some people, they'd sent them around, they'd sure spent a lot of time selling some shares, but they did not have any money yet. But they were confident because they did not know that what they had on their hands, Tony, this mineral, was not corundum. It was another material called anorthosite, which is basically worthless, <laughs> especially for grinding things. They further did not know that as far back as 1891, a chemist had invented a better synthetic abrasive than corundum that he called carborundum, and it was going to be coming to the market very, very soon and making this corundum, even if they did have it, completely obsolete. It's just out the gate, all sorts of bad things happening for this company. Well, they don't know how bad it is, Tony. They think that they're still in a pretty good position. And so, completely oblivious to the hopeless nature of their venture, the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company sinks even more money into their corundum mine. They need a lot of mining equipment, all right? They have a big warehouse where they're going to store the corundum. They have a building where they take the raw, again, quote-unquote corundum that they're mining and grinding it down into a powder. And they build all this stuff up. Unfortunately, the site where they build all their buildings is prone to being buffeted by heavy storms off of Lake Superior. So building is real difficult. They don't have the money to build a dock where they want to build the building, so the logistics of that are all messed up. They finally, though, do manage to get the operations of this factory up and running. They're crunching up, quote-unquote, corundum into powder, and by the time they get it running, it's winter, and everything's snowed in, and the, like, the lake is frozen over, so you can't get boats over there. It's real treacherous on the trails. But they make it out, Tony. They make it out with a load of corundum, with a whole ton by wagon, and they make their first bulk sale of one ton of corundum for $20. That's a fat 20. Big old Jackson. Finally, things are looking up for the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company. Except they weren't, <laughs> because that was the last bulk sale of corundum that they would ever make, Tony. In the history of the company, that was the last $20 that they were going to see from this corundum mining operation. And it becomes clear to these guys as the months pass and they do not sell more quote-unquote corundum that the company is in bad shape. They can't sell stock because now everybody knows that they're not profitable. All right, Captain Disillusion has done a video about them, about how ridiculous their <laughs> Kickstarter is, to put it in 21st century terms. So they're strapped for cash, 
They're not profitable. And yet some of these people are determined to press on. Their general manager, Herman Cable, agreed to work for nothing. And many of their other employees took massive pay cuts. And still the costs of mining this mineral continued to rise and still no sales were made. What I don't understand is how you can get people to do that. Like, how do people have so much faith in a company that they're just going to, like, work for nothing? I understand, like, the GM, he's got a bigger stake. But, like, the average worker, why would you do that? Like, did they have some sort of, like, crazy charisma or witchcraft going on? I don't know, Tony. There are several moments in this story where you would think people would pull out. And some people do. But we're going to get to some even more amazing things that, for some reason, just did not get given up on when it really needed to get given up on. They can't sell their material, Tony. They're, they're, it's unclear when exactly they realize that it's not corundum, but they do start to understand at least that there's no value in what they're trying to do, selling the material directly to grinding wheel manufacturers. So they get together, they put their heads together and they decide we're going to make our own grinding wheels and sandpaper. We're going, we're just going to hop, skip right over these guys who don't want to buy our amazing, wonderful abrasive that we mined out of Minnesota here. And it's definitely not a worthless mineral. We're going to make our own. And you know what you need to make your own grinding wheels and sandpaper, Tony? You need more factories and factories need more money. A lot more money. And you're talking about why they didn't jump ship, right? Here, here's an even more miraculous thing. This company that has, again, in f almost five years of operation, not produced a single dime of profit, does not apparently have a product to sell, goes to this investor from a nearby town named Lucius Ordway, and they convince him that they will give him a controlling interest in the company, so they get enough stocks together from people who had bought stocks initially these guys are the stocks have plummeted in value because they're not producing anything give him 60 percent of the stock of the company in exchange for a cash infusion to keep the company going to build all these factories so that they can turn their worthless not corundum into worthless sandpaper how, how did they still not know that it was not corundum like just no chemists or was or were people not buying it enough to even know I, it's difficult to know because we don't have access to those people anymore. The records are a little bit sketchy. It takes until 1913 before someone from the company finally comes out and says, guys, that, that mine we have out there probably isn't going to produce anything of value, but oh well. But at this point, they're far from at least publicly stating this. It's possible they know at this point and they're not telling anybody because they're trying to do something to turn it around or I don't know this Ordway guy though. And he might be part of the reason why they don't tell anybody that their stuff is worthless. Invest in these factories. He initially commits to $20,000 of investment, which is a lot of, I mean, it's not a lot, a lot of money in business sense today, but it's not even chump change today. And back then it was definitely not chump change. And it takes an entire year for them to get these factories up and running because back then it's not like you just had a company that was making sandpaper making machines, right? They, you had to go to all his charmers in the next few cities over and have them design the kinds of machines that you needed to make sandpaper with, and then come and install those machines. And as you can imagine, all of this stuff can be very, very expensive. While the factory's being built, you have another one of these big Lake Superior storms. It wipes out an entire warehouse full of what they, we assume, still believed was valuable corundum. Things are not looking good for these guys. However, in 1906, they finally get the factory up and running and orders for sandpaper begin trickling in. Business grows through the next few months into the spring and by May, they're selling $2,500 of their sandpaper per month, Tony. <laughs> However, they are also costing $9,000 per month on their factory and their many costs of producing corundum Just running in the red the, very much so lucius ordway at this point had invested a hundred thousand dollars there's way more than his initial offering that he said he was going to do and he's still lending them money but at this point he's getting sick of it he says 
He's got other successful business ventures, so he's not... He doesn't want to lose his shirt on this one. And somehow, they convince him not to pull out. He's very close to pulling out. I read there, there's a series of letters that go back and forth between him and the executives of the company. And they're one of the guys on the board of the company he kind of knew. And they must have had some real persuasive things to say to him because he does stay in. And throughout 1906 invests another 100000 bringing his total investment up to $200,000, and is still losing money. Because they're still trying to sell this horrible, horrible corundum sandpaper, their sales are not great. And so they don't, again, lending to the idea that they don't understand how bad this stuff is, they feel like that they can just get people into buying their sandpapers if they sell them other products. So... They decide that they're going to import another abrasive material, which is garnet, uh, or garnet. My birthstone. Yes, uh, which is apparently relatively uh, widely available, uh, cheap enough to grind up and put on sandpaper at the time. And their their idea here is they're going to kind of do a hook and switch, where you'll get on board for the garnet sandpaper, but then you'll try out some of this carborundum sandpaper, sorry, corundum sandpaper that's probably a little bit cheaper and really like that, and then you'll be on board there. Again, though, their lack of experience comes back to bite them real bad because the Garnet market is really tightly controlled by people in the East who are already very heavily involved in the sandpaper business, and they don't want no competition from the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company. And it goes on like this for a bit. And I want you to understand that everything I've said up until now is true. However, this company did not give up. For somehow, by hook or by crook, they managed to claw themselves into the black with their abrasives manufacturing. They eventually gave up on their corundum. They started manufacturing other kinds of abrasives. They made huge strides in the advancement of the abrasive industry. Uh, they listened to their customers and tried to improve their product wherever they could. And they succeeded, Tony. They succeeded so well that you have heard of this company that was a terrible idea. Started with a product that did not exist by men who did not know how to make the product that they thought they could knew how to make in Minnesota in 1901. The Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company is the 3M company. Like full on, like making post-its and everything else. Post-its, scotch tape, cellophane, like plastic back tape, the kind of packing tape that you get on essentially every package that's used in thousands and thousands of ways throughout around the world. That was their invention. All right. They invented, they, I mean, the number of products that these guys would go on to make is incalculable. And... The success is all down to them listening to what people needed and hearing what their customers' needs were. But they started off with this really, really, really terrible foundation. And somehow they turned it into something great. And I love this story, Tony. I read a book about the starting of the 3M company called Brand of the Tartan several months ago. And during these opening chapters where they're talking about the early histories of 3M, despite the fact that I know that 3M succeeds and becomes a, a company that does $30 billion of business every year in the modern day, I was on the edge of my seat. Like, how in the world did they manage <laughs> to pull this out? How did they not go under? They're so close to the brink so many times. There's so many reasons why it shouldn't have worked out. But somehow they did, Tony. It was a bad idea. I, I, would, I will contend till my dying day that investing in a corundum deposit that was not corundum to make abrasives by people, people who knew nothing about making abrasives was a horrible idea. But somehow they, they persevered. Perseverance won out in the end. And I love it. I love this story. I hope that you guys did too. I know that the reveal there at the end was probably not as exciting for our listeners, Tony, because they have the title of the episode up, I'm sure, in the little caption on YouTube. But Or maybe it just reads Minnesota Mining Manufacturing. Only the future will tell. 
<laughs> and only your future will tell what you have in store for it. So if don't give up unless you should. Who knows? <laughs> I don't know, Tony. You read a story like this and you think, I don't know what to tell people. Sometimes you think maybe maybe you should give up at some point, but I guess if you, the moral of this is if you stick with it long enough, eventually you'll get get good. Yeah, got to get good. Long enough timeline, you might actually make it. But we're also hearing a survivor story. It's a, it's a very small sample size of people that are going to be able to turn it around like this. But it is an incredible story of perseverance. Like, to just get that from sandpaper to what they are now. And that'll do it for this week, guys. Thanks so much for listening. If you have a bad idea that you would like us to cover on the Bad Ideas Show, you can send it to badideasshow at gmail.com. Uh, and don't forget to review us on iTunes. Apparently that's a big help. And yeah, we'll see you guys next week with another episode of Bad Ideas. And if you want to support the podcast directly, you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash human echoes. We'll also have a link in the description at, at the end of the YouTube video. That's the best way to support us, and you get a bunch of bonus stuff like pins, uh, postcards, and tons of other things, as well as getting content early. Hope you guys have an awesome day, and we will see you next week with more bad ideas. Bye!